Welcome to the J-Boy Show, hosted by Jake Crane, the fastest growing sports show in the nation. I'm Coach Hugh Freeze. This is Super Bowl champion Brandon Graham. Hey, this is DJ Shockley, and you're watching. And you're watching. And thanks for watching the J-Boy Show. All right, everybody, welcome to the interview section of today's show. And, and look, you know, we cover the SEC. We kind of expand a little bit. But to be able to know the SEC, you got to know the big dogs that are outside of the conference uh, that an SEC team is most likely is going to be playing in the college football playoff, whether it's 12, 30, 4, or really 3, the way it's been going lately. Uh, and excited to be joined by uh, Bucknuts.com, the 247 Sports Affiliate for Ohio State. He's been covering the Buckeyes for 30 years. So if anybody knows Ohio State, it's this guy right here, Steve Hellwagon. Uh, really appreciate you coming on, Steve. Nice to uh, talk to somebody uh, a little bit, I guess, up to the northeast part of where we uh, typically talk to. Yeah, no problem. Great to be here. And uh, the season will be here before we know it. Uh, I think the countdown for Ohio State is like 73 days until they play at Minnesota, kind of a unique opener on September the 2nd, a Thursday night. And Fox Network Television has never done a uh, midweek college football regular season game and that's going to be the first one on thursday september the second fox network television definitely well the uh, buckeye's going to be looking to shoot some holes in the boat uh, that pj flex built over there uh, and what they've got going but steve i want to start just you know for our audience because again you know a lot of our audience is sec based but ohio state's a huge factor when it comes down to the end and and it's nice to know what's going on ohio state we know how talented they are but looking at this offense first, what are, what are some superlatives? We know there's no more Justin Fields or anybody like that, but who do you see stepping up offensively for the Buckeyes and kind of becoming that next poster boy, I guess you could say? Yeah, I think it's uh, going to be an interesting year for Ohio State uh, because they've got the quarterback, C.J. Stroud, theoretically, uh, uh, I guess you would call him a sophomore or a redshirt freshman, I guess, depending on uh, how you want to look at it uh, semantically with this extra year the NCAA is building in for everybody. I think Ohio State is accounting him as a redshirt freshman, and he's never thrown a forward pass in a uh, live football game, although he did fill in uh, when uh, Justin Fields was injured against Clemson in the Nashville semifinal game. He went in for one play and handed off and then came out. Uh, they've also got two other quarterbacks, Kyle McCord, a true freshman from Pennsylvania who just arrived in the spring. And then Jack Miller, also in the same boat as Stroud, was on the team this past year but didn't throw a pass. So they've got those three guys who they're kind of wading through. And it seems like Stroud probably has the upper hand. But at really every other position on offense, they have an experienced guy. And that's what's kind of crazy about this. I mean, Master Teague is back as the starting running back, although there's, he's got some guys who will push him, including a hot shot redshirt freshman, Travion Henderson, or re, true freshman in Travion Henderson uh, from North Carolina. He's a guy that's going to be mixed in there uh, probably as well. Uh, everybody knows about the two wide receivers, Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson, but they've also got Jackson Smith, the Jigba, who was a freshman on the team last year. And then a couple of incoming freshmen who have really stepped up, Egmeka Aguka, who was the number one wide receiver prospect in the country for 2020, um, or rather, I guess, 2021. And then Marvin Harrison Jr., obviously son of the NFL Hall yeah, of Famer. Good bloodline uh, yeah, he came right in and, and played. Jeremy Ruckert at tight end was kind of a co-starter with Luke Farrell the last couple of years. I think he had two touchdown catches against Clemson in the national semifinal game. And then uh, the offensive line, you lose two outstanding players, Wyatt Davis and uh, Josh Myers, the center. But you're filling in. You've got your two tackles back there, Munford Huge. and Nicholas petit Ferrer, mm -hmm. And then Harry Miller back at guard. Uh, they're going to battle it out for the guard in the center spots, probably Paris Johnson, who was a five-star guy, and uh, Matthew Jones, maybe the, the guys kind of on the, uh, the inside track there. So – You'll have a young guy at quarterback, and sometimes that could spell a defeat if he throws a couple bad picks in a game and, you know, you might lose to a team that you wouldn't ordinarily expect to lose to. But he'll be surrounded by talent at every other position. And talent, not only just talent, but top of the Big Ten talent at nearly every position. And a couple of them are even getting some All-American honors. There was one list I saw came out that has – Olave and Wilson as the nation's number one and number two wide receivers. 
So that's kind of crazy to think about. So uh, they'll take a lot of the uh, emphasis off this quarterback who, if he, whoever he may be, it could be a committee, it could be one guy, as long as he is the distributor and keeps it out of the hands of the opponent. Uh, you know, the 50 point games they have with Justin Fields may just keep right on rolling. You never know. Well, we know the way Ohio State recruits, and, and they're in that top you know, tier of, of guys that are able to bring in talent at multiple positions. Uh, I always talk about roster management a ton. I think Ryan Day is really good at it. I think that's a big feather in his cap. But you kind of mentioned it there. Do you – offenses change. We know that, that coaches, you have to adjust to your personnel and to your strengths, even though some don't. Do you think we'll see a little different style of offense this year? Justin, you know, with the ability to run, you have to account for that on defense. Now, C.J. Stroud, uh, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on his running ability, but I doubt it would be up there with Justin Fields. So do you think we'll see more of a pro-style offense from Ohio State uh, because they're so talented on the outside and, and around him and, and up front, especially at the tackle position? Yeah, I'm not sure they're going to want to put Stroud in uh, harm's way and have him get injured, you know, running the football perhaps as much. And really, they didn't do it all that much with Fields. He was effective when he did do it. Now, Stroud did have a long touchdown run in Ohio State's win at Michigan State this last year. Uh, but, again, that was somewhat of an anomaly. Just, uh, you know, again, it was a blowout game, and I, I don't think Michigan State wanted to be there necessarily. So um, that was just kind of the way that one worked out. But Stroud's got some unique ability to keep plays alive. And I think people are interested in seeing what his decision-making looks like. And do they really turn over the keys to the full offense to him and kind of venture away from the running game as much? Now, they've got a plethora of good running backs. I mean, Master Teague is obviously there. Mayan Williams was kind of a bowling ball who came on late in the season, was running over guys against uh, – Northwestern in the Big Ten Championship game. He was kind of the change-up back when Trey Sermon got it going there. And then, uh, obviously, he did pretty good in the Clemson game as well. So, he's another guy, Trayvon Henderson, <clears throat> excuse me, who I mentioned earlier. I don't know if they're going to venture too far from the running game, but when you have wide receivers and a tight end that are as capable as Ohio State has as pass catchers, I think it's within the realm that that's the direction they're going to skew is to yeah. – Stroud can handle it. Let him throw the football. And I think that's going to be an interesting thing to watch. No, and, and we're going to see. The only way you're going to find out is, is to see and to throw them in there and see if they can do it. And, and look, Steve, Ohio State's had a ton of success. We know that. They've won a ton of big games. They're always a factor in the playoff. But what is one thing, uh, and again, it may be a slight thing, but going through an actual spring and getting into a summer, what's one thing you think that Ryan Day and them learned from that national championship game last year? And, and look, it was an anomaly. It was a crazy season. Alabama returned a ton of talent and experience. Uh, and again, you know, Nick Saban is what it is. Is there something uh, that they're going to adjust this year, or was it just kind of the way it played out? Well, uh, you could probably write a book about last year and how everything kind of <laughs> there was there was a twist and a turn every day it seemed, mm -hmm. and a lot of it due to the pandemic and you know just kind of an unfortunate situation the way it all worked out. I think for a lot of teams and a lot of players, but uh, Ohio State was lucky enough, I guess, uh, to get into the playoff last year. Didn't play quite as many games, obviously, as the rest uh, due to the Big Ten not starting until late October. And then having uh, three games that were scheduled pulled off the schedule, uh, Michigan and Maryland, because of uh, the other schools and Ohio State had canceled the Illinois game because uh, there were too many uh, positive tests on their end. So, you know, it's just kind of the way it worked out is, is uh, you know, sad. Uh, Ohio State was down quite a few guys for the Alabama game. When you think about uh, they lost Trey Sermon on the first play of the game. Plus, you had guys like Tyreek Smith, uh, Tommy Togiai, who did not play against Alabama. Those are two of their top defensive linemen. Uh, there were some other guys who were in and out. Harry Miller, who had been a starter all year on the offensive line, didn't play in that game. So, you know, it's easy to make excuses. Alabama had guys who were banged up as well. And uh, probably I think one of their top offensive linemen didn't play in the game either. So, um, kind of goes both ways. Alabama just had an amazing team. They did. And I think you just have to kind of tip your hat. That quarterback was masterful with the way that he got them in and out of bad plays. And if Ohio State 
snuck a guy up in the box and they threw over the top. And if they back somebody out, then they handed it off to their great running back and he picked up 10 or 15 yards. I mean, it was just, it was a difficult offense. I don't think anybody really came to grips with the Alabama offense yeah. the entire season. And only a couple teams gave them a good game. I think uh, maybe Ole Miss early on and um, uh, the semifinal game against Notre Dame, they were always kind of hanging around within two touchdowns, but never, never really in the game, but never really out of it, you know, that type of thing. And I mean, Notre Dame could say, Hey, we, we played them tougher than Ohio state did, which they did in the final result. But I think if you put Ohio state and Notre Dame on the same field, Ohio state would win, would have won that game probably by a couple of touchdowns typically, um, you know, just, I, I don't know what to say. I, I think you look at it and um, I, I think defensively Ohio state's got some major question marks. And I think that was, uh, illustrated in the Alabama game. Their corners didn't match up. The pass rush didn't match up. And you'd say something about the linebackers, but there's nothing really say because the top four linebackers are all gone and they're not coming back. So, you know, you have four or five returning starters on defense, but what's to say the starting 11 on defense this year is going to be that much more talented than the starting defense they had last year. There's just so many unknowns. And yet there's hope. I mean, you, you hope it's a better overall package. You hope that the guys that are coming back are a year older, a year wiser. I will say it helps to have an All-American like Haskell Garrett up front, defensive tackle, kind of setting the, the, the scene for them. And then you have Tyreek Smith, pretty good at defensive end. Zach Harrison, who's pretty good. Even though the sack production may not be what it is, those guys do make plays. You have a young freshman, Jack Sawyer, who's coming in who can help out. And they have the potential that they could even add JT Tui Moalo uh, from Washington. He visited Ohio State this past weekend, visiting Oregon and Alabama this week, and then will make his decision theoretically between those three schools coming up and uh, potential for him to enroll and be a freshman on this team as well. Uh, linebackers, big question mark. Uh, you do have seven banks back at cornerback and Josh Proctor back at safety. Will the other guys in the secondary, a couple new guys fitting in, will they be better than, uh, you know, you lose Sean Wade to the NFL? Uh, kind of an up and down year for Sean Wade. So I don't know. I think that uh, the quarterback and the defense are the two areas that I kind of go into the season and say, if they lose games, it's going to be because one or the other of those just weren't up to, to snuff on a particular day. But this is still... I mean, the talent that they've assembled here from Urban Meyer from the moment he got there in 2011 on, I think it was November of 2011, they recruited nothing but top five classes year after year after year after year under Urban Meyer. And they've done the same under Ryan Day. So they've got the talent. It's just assembling it, developing it, and putting it in the proper position uh, to succeed. In my opinion, those are going to be the big questions for this team going into 2021. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know, man. I, listen, I feel you going back and looking through this, especially this crazy past year. It's almost like getting in the time machine. But yeah, when you stockpile talent like that uh, and, and you surround yourself with the staff that Ryan Day has and him being a head coach, uh, you can never count Ohio State out. And, and really, uh, even on the unknowns, when you put a guy in there that can physically and athletically can do it, uh, and then you mold him to the system, it tends to work out. But uh, speaking about potential to enroll, if you're a guardian, parent, auntie, uncle, doesn't matter, and you're trying to get more college eyes on your athlete, your student, whoever, you need to download the Dynasty U app right now. It's like LinkedIn for recruits. It's so much more precise and concise, which makes college coaches who love it, a lot of them have downloaded it. It's a lot easier to look through than emails. Uh, so go sign up for the Dynasty U app today. It's on the Google Play Store, anywhere you get your apps. Uh, it's free, it's easy. You've got your GPA, social media, highlights everything in one place, which makes it a whole heck of a lot easier to get eyes on who you want to get eyes on. Doesn't guarantee a scholarship. That's something that the tape has to say and the grades have to say, but it gives you the best chance. That's the Dynasty U app. Go download that today. We're here with Steve Hellwagon from Bucknuts, uh, Bucknuts.com, the 247 sports affiliate of Ohio State, talking, going a little bit outside of the SEC grounds here and talking about a team that an SEC team is going to run into at some point down the road, or at least they have in the past. And Steve, I, I want to talk about the conference for a little bit and the Big Ten. And we know Ohio State has dominated. And if you look around, you know, Minnesota's a little scary with what PJ's got going there. Wisconsin, 
uh, you know, every two or three years. We know they stay with offensive linemen, but if they got a guy that can throw it, they're scary. Penn State's always a problem. When you look around this conference, who are a couple teams that you think, you know, Ohio State, that wouldn't be they wouldn't be scared of them, but somebody that's going to give them, you know, give them a game or at least have the best chance to give them a game because they've dominated that conference. Yeah, Ryan Day has yet to lose to a Big Ten team. And uh, going, yeah, going back even to the Meyer regime, I think the last loss to a Big Ten team was in 2018 uh, at Purdue, I believe. And uh, with uh, Dwayne Haskins at the quarterback, uh, Fields never lost a game to a Big Ten team in his two years. And uh, they lost at Iowa the year before that in 2017. They lost uh, 2016 at Penn State. 2015, they lost to Michigan State at home, and then they were undefeated against Big Ten teams in the 2014 season. So going back 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 27 years, they've lost uh, four games to uh, Big Ten opponents, which is just crazy. So it's the big Uh, one and like the little nine, basically, is what it looks like to me. I know you may not say that. Ryan may not say it, but I I feel like I can say it without uh, any repercussion. You you can feel free to say that. You wouldn't be too, too far off. And really, it's the dominance in the division, too. When you think about it, they haven't lost a division game since 2016 uh, at Penn State. And that was a game they were ahead, I think, 17-3 to at halftime and then had a bunch of special teams mistakes, blocked uh, a blocked field goal and a blocked punt that led to 10 points for Penn State, and they won the game. Um, and Ohio State, uh, since then, whatever, whatever the record is, it's blah, blah, and zero yeah. against uh, – the East since then, I guess it'd be 20 and 0 uh, with four straight years. So, um, is that going to continue ad infinitum? I don't know. Uh, as far as teams that I like in the Big Ten, I like Indiana. If Michael mm-hmm. Penix is able to come back from his injured knee, they have Ty Fry Fogel for him to throw the football to. Their defense made some tremendous strides last year, although they did give up, I think, 42 to Ohio State. That was a heck of a game. OSU was ahead, I think, 28 to 7, perhaps at halftime, and Indiana came back within seven points and and may have had the ball with a chance to tie the game, I think, late. But Ohio State uh, held on and was able to get out of Ohio Stadium, their own stadium, with the win that cinched the East Division for them. And, uh, you know, Indiana was a victim of circumstance, I think, last year. They put the rule in that you had to play six Big Ten games to qualify for the championship game, and then they waived it when they saw, well, you know, how do you deny Ohio State that had beaten uh, everybody put in front of them uh, in the division? And even had they played the final game against Michigan, uh, which couldn't play the game, they had to beg out of the game because of the uh, COVID-positive tests. Uh, Even if they had played the game, uh, which was scheduled in Columbus where Ohio state would have been a three or four touchdown favorite and lost that game. They still would have gone to Indianapolis. The right call was made to send the right team, the better team uh, to Indianapolis out of fairness, I think as much as anything, the six game rule was a nice rule in its, in its, uh, in the way that they wrote it. But I don't think anybody could have foreseen the fact that Ohio state would have opponents cancel two games on them. So um that was uh my thought about that and indiana yet deserved a ton of credit and then they had their own issues with the Penix injury and covid tests on their end that you know they just you know they weren't able to finish the season the way that they wanted that was a team that deserved to be in a new year six game that kind of got sent off elsewhere and, and without Penix, they lost their bowl game but i think they're going to be really good and ohio state has to go there and my guess is it'll be a night game in late october and it'll be hopping in uh, Bloomington, I presume. Penn State, um, man, they lost their first four games, and then they won their last five games, and they seem to really be putting it together. Or I got it backwards. They lost their first five games and then won their first, won the last four. Yeah, yeah, they seem yeah. to be really putting it together at the end of the season. And Clifford, I think their quarterback's pretty good. Um, you know, how are they going to be? Michigan's coming off just a rough year, losing games that they shouldn't have lost with the talent that they have and the COVID issues and different things. It just never felt like a real even, you know, and I know Michigan standards have kind of come down here in recent years. They're not a perennial double-digit win team anymore, but obviously last year was a 
three step backward type season. And now they need to get back to respectability this year and beat the teams they're supposed to beat and not get blown out. I mean, they, they've had some really terrible blowouts here in the last couple of years as well. So I'm interested to see, you know, what they can do. On the other side, Wisconsin is always that constant with the running yeah. game. And uh, Graham Mertz, you know, had a great start to the season, but then he kind of hit a rough patch yeah. there at midseason when they lost. And, uh, you know, they came back and did pretty well at the end. Iowa is always lurking there. And you yeah, just, they're, they're scrappy, they're always, man. They're scrappy. They're always, you can mark them down for nine wins every year. And they got a big one early with Iowa State. If they can clear that hurdle and kind of stamp themselves as a contender, then maybe they continue to believe and they got to get over the Wisconsin hump a little bit. And, you know, they, they, uh, they're interesting. Northwestern has been up one year and then terribly down the next year. Well, they were up last year and uh, you know, we'll see what, what they can do uh, coming into this year. And Minnesota was a surprise last year that they weren't as good as they were, but they had a ton of COVID problems. Me and Nebraska, is Scott Frost ever going to put, put a winner on the field? Just the bowl team. Just he the was bowl the savior. Team. He was the savior, though, Steve. He was the he was the greatest thing since I spread. It's amazing when you you go from a school like that. And look, I'm not saying Scott Frost is a bad coach, but it's one thing to dominate at UCF. It's different to try and go to Nebraska and dominate the way that he did there. And I mean, they haven't had it, and I'm I'm looking around at their roster, and it doesn't seem elite to me yet. And it's been a while, Steve. Yeah, it's uh, 10 years now in the Big Ten, and they've only had one team, I think, good enough to make it to Indianapolis for the championship game. So, And that team gave up 70 points, I think, to a Wisconsin team that subbed in uh, for Ohio State in 2012, I believe. So, yeah, it's um, they got to get uh, – again, we say it every year, they got to get that defense back up to standards, and they've made a little bit of strides. And they got to settle the quarterback issue there too. So – um, getting great high-end athletes to, to want to go and play in Lincoln, Nebraska, I think has been a problem. I think for the last 10 or 15 years, the cachet of playing in Nebraska just isn't what it was at one point. And, uh, you know, they haven't won a conference championship, I think, uh, back to 2000 maybe or something. I mean, it's been a very long time. So, you know, but yet, you know, what's great about this conference, the Big Ten, is a lot of these places that you go to on game day, it's just so electric. And that even includes Michigan State, who's down right now. That's one of the great places, I think, in the country to go watch a game is Michigan State. Michigan has the history. Penn State's top three or top four in the country in this regard. Wisconsin's up there. Iowa's not far behind. Uh, so Minnesota has got a new stadium and Ohio State's opening there and they'll have full capacity of about 50,000 people for a night game. And I expect that to be off the hook as well. So uh, Nebraska, that's top five or 10, certainly in the country as well. So you, you go to some of the best, just as in the SEC, you go to some of the best environments in the country week in and week out. And uh, it, it's an eye opener. I've been doing this, as I said, for almost, full-time for 26 or 27 years, part-time for an extra four or five years prior to that, mostly just the home games at Ohio State prior to that. And you go into some of these stadiums and it's just astounding some of the uh, support that uh, the teams in this conference and other conferences continue to get. And Steve, you know, like you, man, I'm ready to see it back at full capacity. I'm ready to see yes. it back where everybody's out tailgating and having a great time and, and doing things the way that we do it. And hopefully we get that this year. My last question for you, Steve, and, and this is something – you, know, you kind of touched on it a little bit. Uh, and I had a, you know, prove me wrong segment on here with our, our Michigan producer about the Ohio State Michigan rivalry versus Iron Bowl and stuff like that. But, you know, as, as someone who covers Ohio State, it's got a good pulse of the Ohio State fan base. Does Ohio State want Michigan to be good outside of that game to help that rivalry or to boost them even more with strength of schedule? Not saying that they ever want Michigan to win. I know there's not one Ohio State person that wants. Michigan to beat Ohio State, but just to be good enough where that matchup at the end of the year is what it used to be, because that's a big feather in Ohio State's cap, winning against good Michigan teams, even though it's been so rare lately. You make a really good point. I think that there are a lot of Ohio State fans that would like to see Michigan lose every game just to bring the misery upon <laughs> their opponent, those kind of things. Yep. But I'm a little bit more of a pragmatist. I think about some different years in particular. 
like 2006 when it was the number one team against the number two team. That was a landmark moment in the rivalry. Although Ohio State won the game at home, I think it was a three-point game, like 42-39 or 41-38, whatever it was, with Troy Smith putting the cap on his Heisman Trophy season, and there was no Big Ten championship game back then. That catapulted Ohio State, obviously, into the national championship game. They didn't capitalize on it because they lost, got blown out by Florida and Urban Meyer's team that year. Then you go ahead to 2014, and here Ohio State uh, is in the kind of discussion, lost the early season game with Virginia Tech, and they need uh, that win over uh, over Michigan, you know, uh, you know, to kind of some, help cement the resume, but here's Michigan limping in at 500. I think they ended up that year five and seven, and I think that was the end of the car regime was 14, not car, uh, Brady Hope was the end of his time at Michigan, I, if I've got my years correct, in 14, because I think Rodriguez uh, came in and, or got, I mean, I'm screwing up all the names today. Uh, Harbaugh. Go. There you Harbaugh go. Harbaugh. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm calling Hope Carr and I'm calling <laughs> Harbaugh Rodriguez. They're all, all, all of it goes together. Yeah, it's one big gel I mean, like gelatin. Yeah, it, it all kind of goes together. You can't underrate how much damage the Rodriguez era did. And it goes back to one thing. He had an NFL quarterback in Mallet and said, oh, he's a pro-style quarterback. Eh, we're going to go with Tate Forcier or we're going to go <laughs> yeah. with Denard Robinson or something. And Mallet went off to Arkansas and put that team in the Sugar Bowl at Arkansas because they played Ohio State. So that's where, you know, things went off a cliff. I mean, they didn't maintain it from Carr. They thought they had better ideas on how to win in the Big Ten beyond what Michigan and Carr had done. And that's where it went off a cliff and they've never been able to bring it back. I yeah. mean, you know, and it, whether it's kind of like with Lincoln, Nebraska, do, do high end athletes other than those from the Detroit, you know, city league or Detroit Catholic league, do they want to play at Michigan? And the answer is a resounding no. We haven't seen anybody go there who's been top of the line other than some isolated cases like the Rashawn Gary, uh, Peoples, uh, well, Peoples Jones, the wide receiver, uh, the safety, I'm drawing a blank on his name that played for the Browns for a year or two. Uh, you know, these guys, uh, you know, it's been rare that they, they can't recruit in the same level as Ohio State. So the result is what you get. But that 14 game, Ohio State got no bump at all. They beat a Michigan team with a losing record and obviously lost JT Barrett to the injury in that game. They got no bump. And in Franklin County in central Ohio, it was throw a parade. We beat Michigan for the fourth straight year or third straight year, whatever it was, and throw a parade. This is great. But nobody outside central Ohio gave them any credit at all. They had to go out the next week and beat Wisconsin 59 to nothing to justify their place in the college, first college football playoff, which they ultimately won. Then 16, you had the two versus three game. Ohio State wins that game in double overtime goes on uh, to the playoff and got routed by Clemson 31 to nothing. Didn't parlay that into anything, but um, you know, when you've beaten a good Michigan team, you've been rewarded for it, even though you didn't make anything out of the reward in those particular seasons. The last two times they played them beat them by what four touchdowns, basically both times didn't play them last year for the first time since 1912 or something. Yeah. So and we all remember that know, year. <laughs> yeah, we all, yeah, we all remember. You know, what's interesting, this rivalry, uh, the first 13 times they played something like that, the record was for Ohio State was 0-13-2 or something. And Chick Harley was the first guy who lead, led Ohio State to a win over Michigan. And from that moment on, Ohio State's had the edge in the rivalry. If you just take out the first 14 meetings in, in prehistoric time before <laughs> 1914 or whatever, it, it, Ohio State's got a slight edge. But uh I can remember on the day that uh, Trestle was hired back in 20, 2001, Ohio State was something like down 19 or 20 in the all-time record, and now they've whittled that down to down six. So it's coming one day. They're going to draw even with them all-time in the all-time all record because, you know, things in motion just continue in motion, and Ohio State's going to continue in motion 
it's up to Michigan and the rest of the Big Ten to catch up to them. Uh, without a doubt, and, and they've been the, the beacon of the conference for a while now and obviously in that rivalry. But, Steve, great stuff, man. Uh, really enjoyed this. The first time kind of dipping in the Big Ten. Would love to get you back on as we get closer to the year, maybe as we got a better idea of what's going on, the quarterback situation for Ohio State. I know that's a big question mark and defensively as well. Tell everybody where they can find you on social media and where they can find your content as well. Definitely. We'll get back and do it again. I, I'll just throw in one thing. It's not a, soft, not a soft launch for Ohio State. At Minnesota, although a middle-of-the-road team, a road game, first time a quarterback's really going to play. Yeah, I appreciate it. That'll be a tough one. And then back home with Oregon, who I believe uh, routed or they beat Iowa State in the Fiesta Bowl, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So uh, they're going to come to Columbus with the belief they can beat Ohio State and put themselves in the playoff hunt. So two tough games uh, for Ohio State out of the box. Then it gets a little more manageable after that. But, uh, yeah, Steve Hellwagon, at Steve Hellwagon on Twitter. That's with an E-N. And then bucknuts.com, part of the 24-7 Sports Network, and uh, that's where we're at. And uh, covering all the uh, developments right now with recruiting, we've got another football camp to go to tomorrow, and we'll be out there out there on the football field tomorrow. Yeah. Look at, looking forward to it. No doubt. Speaking about recruiting, getting back to normal, Steve, I really appreciate it, brother. We'll do this again. Stay safe out there. Appreciate you guys joining us. Subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Head over to thejboyshow.com. Grab some of that merch. It's been another edition of the J Boy Show, talking a little Ohio State, and we're going, going, gone. The J Boy Show is produced by David Cohn, Technical Director Dave Hammock, Creative Director David Culbertson, Audio Engineer Faison Sharif, Production Assistants Blaine Crane and Kyle Orr, Executive Producers Jake Crane, Vince Thompson, Steve Chamberlain, and David Cohn. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit our website thejboyshow.com for updates regarding our newest apparel and merch designs. Win the water cooler with the J-Boy Show.